Welcome. NOAA has just issued its July of 2021 Global Climate Report, and this video is a summary of that report and other related data. Let's take a look at the summary map for climate trends across the globe. First of all, July was the hottest July on record. Arctic sea ice was at its fourth lowest extent, that's 19% below the long-term average. On the other hand, the Antarctic sea ice was at its eighth highest, which is 3% above the long-term average. We have prevailing so neutral conditions, which makes it all the more remarkable that July was the hottest uh, July on record. In the Asia, we had the hottest July on record. Europe, the second hottest. South America, the 10th hottest. Africa, the seventh hottest. North America, the sixth hottest. And Australasia, the fourth hottest. Cyclone activity across the globe was above normal and we had the formation of Hurricane Elsa in the Atlantic Basin. So let's take a look at the individual records by district. Globally, as I said, it was the warmest July on record being 0.93 degrees centigrade above the long-term average. Land was also first at 1.4 degrees centigrade. The ocean was sixth at 0.75 degrees centigrade. The Northern Hemisphere was second warmest at 1.14 degrees centigrade. The Southern Hemisphere was the fifth warmest at 0.7 degrees centigrade above the long-term average. So let's see how those temperatures have been distributed around the globe. We still have a large area of cold water off the southwest coast of South America. So that's the remnants of the La Nina, but overall the conditions are still and so neutral. We have a lot of high temperature areas, including Europe, Northern Africa, Asia, stretching out into the Pacific, all the way across the Pacific, in fact, to the western part of the United States, and also the southern tip of South America. But there are some cold patches to compensate for that, and we have those up in northern Canada, the southeast of the United States, southern Africa, and a cold spot in Siberia, which is actually quite interesting because that's usually a hot area. Here we have listed the daily, monthly, and all-time records for the month of July. If you look at the daily records, you'll see that the ratio between new high temperature records and new low temperature records is about four to one. For monthly, it's about seven to one. And for all time records, it's 12 to one. Let's take a look at the map that shows where records are being set. If you have a record low, it will show in this very dark tone of blue. And the slightly lighter shade of blue indicates much cooler than average. And on the map, there are no examples of either of those. However, there are a large number of much warmer than average and 66 pixels are setting records. This table shows the relative ranking of each month over the last few years and then the ranking of each year on the left hand side. You can see I've entered July at number one. That's moved all the other months down. A lot over the last few months has been made of Roy Spencer's lower tropospheric measurements dipping way down to below average shown here on the right. However, this last month has popped up again and so is very much well above average. The thing to look at here is not the individual spikes and dips, which are, as you can see are highly variable, but the general overall trend. Since January of 1979, the overall global trend in these sorts of data has been 0.14 degrees centigrade per decade of warming. That's often not the impression given by people using these data, they seem to say that it's stable, it isn't. The overall mathematical trend in this is a positive trend, i.e. a warming trend, and is not far behind the, the temperatures measured by the service by thermometers. The ocean, they claim, is 0.12 degrees centigrade per decade, and the land 0.18 centigrade per decade. So even the data collected by one of the biggest global warming skeptics who is actually a real climatologist, is showing a warming trend, which until about a decade ago, he was denying. So let's take a look at the upper atmosphere as seen by some other investigators. The lower atmosphere, according to the star measurements, are is plus 0.3 degrees centigrade above the long-term average. That's the seventh hottest. The mid troposphere is plus 0.14 degrees centigrade above the long-term average, which makes it the 17th hottest. 
and the stratosphere, which we know is cooling, is minus 0.36 degrees centigrade above the long-term average, which is the 11th coolest. So next we'll take a look at the cryosphere. That's the areas of ice in both the northern and southern hemisphere. Arctic sea ice remains at a very low level. This month was fourth smallest on record. And that's after 21 successive years of below average sea ice in the Arctic. In contrast, the Antarctic sea ice is above average. After four years of being below average, it suddenly jumped. It's now the eighth largest on record with 2% above the long-term average. The crux of the climate crisis is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So let's take a look at how much it has changed uh, for this month. Here is the NOAA plot for carbon dioxide for July of 2021. As you can see, it's 2.34 parts per million above last year's total, which is fairly similar to what we've been having for the last few months. And we're beginning the turn down as we go from summer of uh, 2021 into the autumn months. As far as El Nino and La Nina are concerned for July of 2021, we're still in neutral conditions. I is above 0 0.5 in the index. However, the trend is down according to the models. And so by September or October, we may be getting into a mild La Nina again. And that would come back out of that, according, again, according to the models, sometime early next year. So let's take a look at solar conditions. Solar cycle 25 is growing quite nicely, thank you. Uh, it's growing faster than solar cycle 24, so it probably means that it's going to be a more active cycle overall than solar cycle 24. If we look at flares, we can see there's a burst of activity back in November of 2020. And if you recall at the time, I said there'd be a new burst in six to nine months time, and indeed, second burst has occurred and it is just about on that time scale. So when will the next one be? Well, probably six to nine months down the road. So towards the end of this year and early next year, we will have the, this another burst. But between those, two, between the second and the third burst, we're going to have a relatively quiet time for two or three months where uh, the activity will be quite low. However, it'll be probably higher than the activity in January, February, and March of 2021, you can see there was quite low. Each time these bursts are going to get larger. Note that the first burst here, we had 87 C flares and one M flare. The second burst, we had 116 C flares, eight M flares and an X flare. And I expect a proportionally larger increase in activity for the next burst of activity that we get. So anyway, let's see what the sun does, but uh, it seems to be following the previous patterns that we saw before. So let's summarize all of this. We're in ENSO neutral conditions at the moment, but trending back towards La Nina in the next few months. Globally, it was the hottest July on record. And the highest temperature records were being set four times faster than the lowest, which means the globe is still warming. So until next time, Stay safe and goodbye.